Hi everyone, it's Amanda and Kate here. Welcome to Psychology at Sea. And I'm super excited to introduce you to the amazing Dr. Kate Bacher, who's a clinical performance psychologist and works in human behavior and complex environments. But Kate, how about you introduce yourself? Yay, hi, I'm so stoked to be here. And thanks to Amanda for actually bringing me into this world and allowing me to immerse in this world. Uh, my background is, I want to say it's a little bit unusual, but I don't know, hard to say these days and what is unusual. I, I uh, grew up, which is not the right way to say it, but I became a psychologist through an undergraduate degree, followed by two years of a clinical internship with the Australian Army. And what that taught me was how to interact with people and how to manage psychological issues in a really asymmetrical and a really unusual environment. So from there, I eventually left the army. <laughs> eventually, that's a different story. Um, but it required some recalibration where I went to do my further studies which was required as a as a psychologist but also in terms of understanding what's what's necessary what's important what's changeable and from there so I I completed my doctorate in clinical psychology and most of the team that I worked with while I was away while I was doing that was either military for first responders, some corporate work, a lot of work with police, all sorts of different things. Um, and since then, my passion, my profession, but also my passion has been working with or within mental health in remote austere and wild environments. I am a climber, I'm a mountaineer, um, I love camping. I love being in the outdoors. I love all of that sort of stuff. So the more that I can embed my passions and my interests and my profession, the better that everything is. So that's what I hope to do. I, I hope to understand and learn from all of you and also provide some scientific and psychological background to everything that you guys already actually do but just some context as well in and around that fantastic and then the reason that you jumped out at me and I knew we had to work together uh, and become good friends and colleagues is that you were talking at a medical wilderness medicine conference about um, your mountaineering and how you became so passionate about mountaineering and wilderness medicine and psychology, which is really an area that has not been done extra very well. Much. Not, it, I won't say very well. well. it just hasn't yeah. really been done. Um, yeah. It's all very new and it's so different because we're in situations in terms of mountaineers and people living in mountains and people on super yachts, while it could sound like two completely different worlds, um, and the military as well, and going off in deployment, they're very similar because, as I say, you know, there's no ambulances where we go. We've got low resources. We're on our own. If someone needs to be evacuated, it could be 15 hours. It could be 15 days. It could be even longer than that if we're down in Antarctica or Patagonia or, you know, the Northwest Passage and some of the places we go. And... Mm -hmm. There was a talk you did about an experience you had on Mont Blanc where mm -hmm. um, you as a psychologist realised that the need for wilderness medicine in terms of psychology. Um, could you just talk about that for a couple of minutes to put yeah. everything in perspective? So I, this is going to be some terrible truths for everybody, but I, the, my first mountaineer experience was when I was on the verge of leaving the army um, and I'd broken up with my partner or my partner had broken up with me. doesn't matter. We ended the relationship uh, and there was an opportunity to go with the Australian army uh, 
can't remember the name, but it was basically to go with the army's version of an introduction to medical or, or sorry, to mountaineering. Um, in New Zealand, I went there and it was horrendous. And I hated, I hated, it was like type two fun, but the very edge of type two fun versus torture. Um, the actual instructor was old school. It was lovely, but old school and was not very um, well received for any response. Anyway, I, it, it meant that I spent four or five days in an ice cave, snow cave, ice cave with two others who had no idea also like me how to build an ice cave or a snow cave so <laughs> we weren't very protective we had to huddle together to stay warm I lost five kilo over four days I lost five kilos and shivering and weights and all that sort of stuff and then there was but there was on this whole trip there was one day one day that was incredible and it was it was a bluebird day and we managed to, I don't think it was an actual summit, but there was a hill that we got to the top of and we came back from. And at the end of the day, and I was like, you know what, there's something in this. There's something in this. And I hated every second, every freaking moment of that training, except for that one day. And I thought, you know what, if there's something to learn and something to, for something to do from this, I want to do it. And, <laughs> and I did. So then I went to France and went to Chamonix and organized some actual proper training that was not military training and it wasn't slightly unhinged. And you could actually go and train beautifully in the mountains and come home and have a steak and wine for tea. So that's what I did. And I learned, but even then, it was an amazing experience. But I also learned from that experience that I would witness and I would be part of death and destruction so we climbed up over it was on our way to Mont Blanc we climbed up and ascended a ridge and then just before there was a oof, the core where we had to cross and over the and we had to link in and cross it and look after it but over the other side what we saw was someone fell and it was it was a group the first group ahead of us and someone fell and we don't know to this day whether he fell because he was hit on the head or whether he just fell and fell and then kept kept going but he fell and kept going and my guide at the time I'm I'm not to so you know I'm not good enough to not have a guide um but he called in emergency rescue and all these sort of things and they came in and they in French and they picked him up and they picked him up. And it was like it was this horrible experience because it was like a claw. They picked up his body and then took him away. And that was it. And then my guide, who was lovely, but also very French in the way that he um, tackled these sort of things. He was like, right, we're done. We've called and rescue. We're going to keep going. Let's keep going. And so we did. And then we crossed and we passed over the group or the team that had lost their person, that had lost a teammate. And we went up to the next uh, the next hut. And at that stage, one of my teammates was really struggling from what he'd seen and how it was. And so I spent a number of hours with him trying to, not trying to reconcile anything, but actually just trying to work with him through that situation my climbing guide at the time bless his cotton socks was like speak to Kate she's a psychologist and I was like but I'm also a participant and all this sort of stuff and anyway so I looked after the guy at the top and we got him down he didn't want to continue and that was fine and then I came and then we kept going and and all sorts of stuff but it was tough and it was hard and the emotional stuff was the most unexpected stuff and <laughs> I look back and I'm, there's a part of me that's kind of like wow like, why would you as a freaking guide put the responsibility of their emotional stuff onto me yeah I get I'm a psychologist but also I don't have any of this any of this sort of stuff 
but it it worked out okay and it all worked out okay but what it highlighted to me was that there is such a dark in the capability and not the capability but the capability and the confidence of guides to say you know what you've just witnessed this horrific situation this is how we're going to look after you and this is what to expect and this is what's normal and these are the options what I saw in that moment was a panic guide who didn't know what to say and then me trying to kind of <laughs> salvage whatever was there but that was one it wasn't my job I had to do it but it was never my job but at the same time what I saw was the guides don't have the training necessarily in how to manage this side of things so that's that is kind of what led on to the psych first aid into everything else that's happened since then and that's exactly why I chose you because, you know, in yachting, we really need people that understand what it's like to function in harsh and remote and complex oh. environments. And that story really hit home to me because I've been in a similar situation at sea. And I think in the olden days, maybe that was how we did cope with things. It was like, oh, someone just broke their leg or, uh, you know, right. yeah. had their head stopped off or, or, or lost their life or got swept overboard. Well, let's just carry on and then maybe we'll get drunk at the pub after. Um, mm -hmm. In this day and age, it doesn't work and we really need to have the skills to look after people and the more we know. And another thing that I believe happens is even that I'd like to point out and those of you that have been watching us and following me for a while, know my story is that I realized when as a registered nurse and you know a mental health nurse and a trauma nurse when there was an accident on board I was there sailing like you were there climbing and mountaineering I wasn't there as a trauma nurse you weren't there as a psychologist and when you suddenly have to put that hat on you know it, it takes a lot of energy and for me it caused a lot more stress than a same situation that would have happened in a hospital situation or in the clinic I worked in, which I'm sure you'd agree. Or if you expected, if, if you were in the mode of I am the medic for this or I am the psychologist for this, that's really different in how you approach things than suddenly you're like, I am a participant and I don't have any regulations or anything around this and I'm literally doing this because I love it and I want to do it and I want to learn about this then suddenly you're thrown into the situation where you're you're the professional even though it's the last thing you want the last thing that you need and the last thing that is actually kind of acceptable to you because you're like no no I am a participant let me let me not be a nurse let me not be a specialist let me for a time just be a participant in this world and and navigating that and then I'm not even going to say ethical but I'm going to say the moral situation of like no I don't want to do this but actually I know that I can help this yeah. I know that this is something that I can help with even though I really don't want to because it's my holiday and this is this. And then how that looks on the ground, but also how that fits with you. It's really difficult because it's also like it comes back to something that we don't talk about much, but it's, it comes back to responder self-care and yeah. how much can you give to somebody without losing yourself. Mm. I think that's a really big thing too. And then that leads to moral injury and all other stuff. But that's a really significant thing where you're like, no, I can do it when I'm in the moment. But actually the impact of doing it in the moment has such a bigger impact later on on the respondents. And this is why we've both come together and identified the need for psychological first aid and safety and resilience in the wild and at sea. And something that Kate taught me recently uh, which is why I'm pushing to get this information out to you guys now, 
is about this thing that I've totally experienced, but I didn't know it was a thing. And it's called the third quarter phenomenon. And yep, yep. when you hear this, you're going to have a massive aha moment. But I'm going to let Katie explain it because you helped me realize so much of so many of my trips and expeditions and, and time at sea when I was working on yachts and races. Tell us, what is the thing? So, so essentially, Adam Grant is the guru on this, if you want to go and Google him and, and, and follow him. But basically, the reality is that if you've gone from one high-intensity situation to another, excuse me, you need a break in between. There's no way you can literally switch from one to another and not be affected. So what we call the third quarter is basically, or the third quarter phenomenon, is basically you do your work, your life, but somewhere between the third quarter of the the almost end of where you are to the beginning of being at home, there has to be a space. And that space might be driving home from work to home, or it might be getting home and sitting in a study for an hour before you interact with the family, or it might be going for a run, leaving work and going for a run and going for somewhere else. So what is required is there is a significant transition time from leaving work and getting home and, and the different personalities and personas that you need. And you can't switch from one to the other readily unless there's a lag and it gets really hard. So one of the best things and scientifically proven is there's the third quarter phenomenon which is basically like all the transition stage which is basically like you leave work you need an hour for yourself the hour for yourself might be meditating it might be reading a newspaper it might be reading a novel it might be going for a run but somewhere between you shut off work and then your next persona have to be i'm a dad i'm a father i'm a partner I don't need kids it's still like I've left work and then when I come home I have to be a partner and doing this somewhere in that in that space in between allows for decompression and actually allows for reinvigoration of interest and hobbies and all that sort of stuff but mostly if you don't do that you will never successfully transition from hard 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 hardcore worker to home, 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 home. Somewhere in between that is the most important psychological stage. And that psychological stage, like I said, that psychological stage might be I'm going bowling or I'm listening to podcasts or I get home and I sit in the front study and read audiobooks for 30 minutes. But there has to be, it's almost like this is mandatory for the transition between work and home. And in order for that transition to be successful, it has to be something that engages you, that you enjoy and that you can relax into. And then you switch to, all right, now I'm in husband, wife, partner, caregiver mode. But it's so important because if you don't do that, that whole sequence will never happen successfully. And not only that, there will be so many repercussions from family and family and family and you'll still be stuck in your mind and trying to deal with shit while you're trying to deal with the family in this. So the third space is what it's called. Not even the transition. It's called the third space. And it's literally doesn't need to be a physical space. It might be an emotional space. It might be a physical space, whatever it is. But you coming home, when you switch off, there is a space there, the third space that allows you to transition from work to home. And that transition moment might be talking. It might be silence. It might be going for a run. It might be reading books, whatever it is. But it's so fundamentally important to keep you going well and to keep your family going well. So that's it. The, the third space, it's incredibly important and often underlooked, but one of the greatest things in terms of not just uh, 
you know, family and couples dynamics, but actually in terms of mental health as a whole. And what I really want to speak into here and having many conversations, especially with rotational crew, is that we're not driving home. We're often flying long haul, traveling long distances, but they often find that time on the plane is yep. not enough. That, and that they've found huge benefits in actually stopping in a hotel for a couple of days, even a week after a big trip to have that decompress. And what I've also found is really useful since I've been sharing the psychological first aid work with these crew that giving them themselves the permission to reflect, the permission to oh, absolutely. Yeah. time to go, I don't have to be big and tough right now. That that was a hard few weeks, actually. And, you know, that owner was quite difficult. All those guests were pretty hard work. You know, all the crew were, you know, awesome. and, and, yeah. and to give yourself that time rather than I think what we did in the olden days is push it down, push it down, push it down, Talk you it know, up and get home, going. smash some beers or hit the gym or throw yourself into family life and pretend none of that happened. And, yeah. and, and, the, and, you know, from my experience, what happens with that when I've done that coming from nursing, coming from sailing trips, coming from big races, big guest trips with owners, is you're pushing it down and pushing it down and pushing it down and your little nervous system starts going, oh, I, there's not much more space to push anything down. And, and that's when something, you know, catastrophic could happen. happen. Yeah, exactly. And also, I mean, nerd, but if there, anyone wants to read a book about this, Bessel van der Kolk's The Body Keeps the Score is amazing. And and I heavy. categorically... Heavy. That's so nerd to be read. Exactly. Or listen to if it's on Audible. Also, know that it's not an exciting read. It's a really freaking boring read. <laughs> and it's not... It sounds more exciting than it is. But exactly. Gotcha. But it's so incredible and there's so much greatness within his book. Yeah. You're like, that. that's worth <laughs> tolerating the boredom and slash the... This is not so exciting. Well, and some of the horror stories. Some of the yeah, stories some of the horror stories. You know, just this really apply to me because I didn't grow up as an orphan that was bashed and battered around. But then it comes full circle, and you realise how the body does keep a score and that pushing down, and how much the impact is, and what you can do from there. So I would say that's an amazing book to read slash listen to. And that's going to take time to read and listen to because it's it's not lovely reading. It's not easy reading, but it's worthwhile reading. Maybe that's don't do it on your third quarter, third phase. <laughs> <Take impressions on. laughs> do it first, first quarter or yeah. final fourth quarter. That's the, the best time. To Just before listen. we move on, I also want to talk to you a bit, having been done deployments, having done some epic expeditions and you know, spending a lot of time in the mountains in, in really remote, harsh and complex environments. I also believe that there is something that happens to the crew, the team, um, the group in that third quarter as well. So you start off, you're all on a high, you know, yeah. and then in the second quarter, there's normally one person that might get a bit weird, but everyone else is keeping good spirits. And then by the third, it's, you know, it, 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 it's getting hard to keep up morale. Um, yeah. it, it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, yeah. and, and would you say, you know, that that's an important thing to recognise in terms of how we yeah. relate to people, how we speak to people how, and how we deal with our peers in, the, in, in that time away? You know what? If we know that there is the slump or the swamp that I like to call it, Swamp or quicksand. None of these analogies get any kinder or nicer. Um, but in the third quarter, everyone hits the actual swamp or the quicksand and they go down and they go down and down and down. So if they know that there are people in it, and, and to be fair, many of them do know that it'll get better, but many of them don't. Many of them are stuck. They haven't had the education to know that this is 
transient and normal and excellent and you know then we can manage that when it happens so I think understanding that it will happen and then also understanding before the actual tasks are you know do you know you do you know how this will be and what happens and what do you need at that time and that's conversation between anyone on expeditions with their teammates and or with their expedition bosses and and I can speak to a couple of those right now um but it's very much you know you when you're at your worst and this is what I do with a number of NRL and NRLW players is which is an actual rugby league for those of you that (laughs) sorry (laughs) but it's basically like when you're at your worst what does it look like when you're hungry when you're angry when you're losing your shit how does that play out for you are you are you a person who is snappy are you a person who withdraws? Are you a person who needs people to snug and snuggle and do all that sort of stuff? And even just knowing that means that if if you know what, who, and, and in fact, sorry, this is a side note. I've done some work with the NRLW ladies this week. NRL ladies. Um, basically is when you're at your worst and when you're at your actual worst as in you're hungry angry everything is out of control um you don't know what to do with this you're out of control you this is this um how do you respond and it's not judgy it's literally like a curiosity or a kind of experimental side are you an angry person are you a cranky person are you a sad person and then that's great so the first thing is that's how you respond and the next session the next part is what do you need you know you might be a ragingly angry cranky person when something's out of your control what you need is actually a hug and a pat on back or what you need and this is what I've seen with some of the NRL W ladies that are like don't talk to me at all I know I've 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 messed up. I've done this. It's don't talk to me. Someone can come and pat me on the head, but yeah. nothing else. Or there might be actually. I know that I've already messed up, but I need someone to say you're okay. Remember, remember, just reset, reset, and we'll go from there. So a lot of it is about knowing yourself and knowing what you need, and then if you can actually articulate that and even if you can't I can I I can always help you that (laughs) but I can help you like to your team it's going to be really important because you know what sometimes you're going to need tough love and sometimes you're going to leave you're going to need less than tough love and just hugs and you know support and all that kind of stuff so it's knowing yourself and knowing what works for you and then helping the rest of the team understand what that is and I love you know when when you talk in the uh, wilderness psychological first aid course about you know having a sanity plan which is something I speak to all my yacht crew about and the guys that have just all finished the ocean race you know, all came up with a really solid sanity plan, whether it was looking at pictures of their kids on their phone or, you know, there's such a key to success there as well. But something I really want to speak into at the moment is what really sealed the deal and made me realise we absolutely had to convert wilderness psychological first aid to the marine maritime industry. Yes, I love it was also knowing how to, Kate's set up this amazing framework that we're working together to adapt to yachting in terms of, you know, how where people are happy and healthy and in the green zone and where they're in a dangerous position and red zone and will need evacuation and yeah. and the signs and symptoms that that person could be showing. And, and rather than go, oh, so-and-so is a bit weird, you know, there's there's some really clear points there on 
Um, are they really withdrawn? Are they taking self-care? Um, are they functioning? And how long have they been doing this for and how and why and all sorts? Yeah. Yeah. And then the time frame too. So has there been a major incident and how long since? If it's only been a few days, then that's probably okay. If it's been two weeks, mm, three weeks, four weeks, okay, we definitely need professional psychological intervention. Yeah. Yeah. So I on agree. the note, we're, we're going to be talking about our psychological first aid and safety courses later. But what I really want to um, define right now is the difference. What is the difference between mental health first aid and psychological first aid? Because oh, in Yachting, we've got an, an amazing course. Seize the mind. Emma, your work is amazing. Um, so, and they do great work in terms of mental health first aid. And I want to just explain that we are all working together, but what is, what would it, what is the difference in your mind between that? So mental health first aid is very much about when you come across someone or yourself and there are a number of mental health symptoms, sorry, I'm drinking water, sparkling water and trying to deal with it. Um, but the reality is psychological first aid is in a crisis. Mental health, mental health first aid is in day-to-day -day work. Yeah. You're going to come across someone. Sorry, you're going to come across someone who is struggling. Sorry. Who's trying? I'm sorry, sorry. Who is struggling and also who needs a little bit of direction? but who needs collegial support before they go and get professional support. So they actually really need a friend, a peer, a family member, probably not a family member, that would not probably go so well, but it, it needs a peer or a colleague to say, hey, I've noticed these things about like in your behaviour for the next, over the last couple of months. And, you know, I think you're the bee's knees, but also how can we help you? Because I also know that there are some things going on in the background and I'd like to do this. And, and it can be framed and I've observed, and this is kind of the conflict resolution stuff, where it's, I've observed you, bang, 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 bang. And this is the impact, bang, 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 bang. And I then suggest bang, bang, bang. So it's like it, it's, it's a very prototypical kind of conflict resolution template of what's going on. But essentially it's, it's actually going to somebody who's in, in, in trouble or in strife and saying, hey, I've seen this about you. Have you done this? And if you haven't, can I help you do this? Yeah. And then psychological first aid is more in the moment of crisis. So it's it's you've experienced this potential critical incident or potentially traumatic event and just keep an eye on this. And if this doesn't happen, if you haven't, if you haven't bounced back, not bounced back, but like if you, if all of these things that you're experiencing continue to be experienced for the for the next month then speak to somebody because yeah. they're very freaking normal for the first month and they're actually very healthy for the first month but if they go on for longer than the first month then call me call a professional call your well-being person call whoever it happens to be um and mostly it'll be me because i'll mush stuff up in and, in and around um but basically mental health first aid is more about I've noticed these signs and symptoms and I'm a peer and I'm bringing them to your attention and here are some avenues psychological first aid is you've just experienced a whole lot of horrific fuck wittery shit that you should never have experienced and even if you have experienced it and even if it's in your mandate you're a human and you don't need to experience anymore so 
if you can digest what you've experienced, that's great. But if you can't, or even if you can, in a few weeks' time, come and chat to me because I can help you all look at the freaking, the, all the stuff that Amanda and I are going to send through and say, hey, you know what? I'm good. I'm getting better. I'm getting you better. Or you can say, you know what? It's been four weeks since this happened and I'm still pretty affected by it. So that's all I'd say. If you're if it's been four weeks or more, contact me directly. Um, if it's been less and things are getting better, know that you're okay. Know that things are going well. Um, but we'll also try and try and um, develop a step by step program process for wherever you are. Fantastic. So now we've established what psychological first aid is and when we have the need for intervention. You've already been um, doing a lot of this work with sports, really high profile sports teams, um, yeah. corporate and first responders and the military. Um, so in what would you say that having the impact of psychological first aid has been on and them having these this knowledge has been on these teams? Amazing. They yeah. they don't know what they don't know. But actually having access to people who are like, no, we're reassuring you with this and this, and it's not even reassuring you. It's like, this is what's normal and this is what's what needs further investigation. It's been so well received. And there's always going to be more and more and more and more of that. So I would say that don't hesitate to, even if you're not sure that it's right, for you or even if you're not sure that this is the you know the next step just ask just step forward and say hey this is kind of can I it does this work for me or does it not and we can all we can always say hey this is perfect for you and we can go forward or we can say nope redirect to this person over here so it's not even like oh hey we own everything or know everything we're literally like no it's this is perfect for you or it's not and we will send you in the best actual direction so that's I think that's the best the biggest thing is to know that we want to do the best to help all of you but also if that doesn't work we're not egotistical enough to say oh come to us anyway we're literally like let us redirect you to the right people yeah absolutely and um, we will because we're building an amazing reference list and every, everyone you know, awesome. has different needs. We're not all the same. Um, but yeah. speaking about needs, if people say that you teach what you need, you know, and I know I have to question this because I'm Nothing. just going to put my hands in the air or my hand on my heart and say, when I did the psychological first aid for wilderness and mountain medicine, it changed my life and I thought, why wasn't I teaching this 20 years ago and why was oh. I never taught this as a trauma nurse, as an expeditioner, as a, as a sailor, um, as, as just a human being navigating the modern world? Is, did you feel the same? As a psychologist and someone that's been in the military and been deployed? Oh, God, 100%, you, sorry, you know, as, I put my, uh, as I put my snuggly hat on. No. A hundred percent. And every day I'm baffled by the fact that I'm like, why is this not here? It's it's not rocket science. It's really freaking easy. And I'm honestly, every day I'm baffled by the fact that this hasn't been taught, needs to be taught. People want to, I'm not baffled by the fact that people want to learn, but honestly, I look at the background and everything. I'm like, I don't understand. Like it's so, it's so common sense to do this. And I don't, I literally don't understand why it hasn't been part of it. And and I'll and I'll say and I'll say this to my part. I'll say this to actually, I'll say this to anyone who will actually listen, is that I don't understand why this isn't front and center. 
Yeah. And yeah. even, I mean, I've spoken to Seth Hawkins and um, a number of other people. I'm like, why? Why is this not there? Why is it not there? And they're just like, well, it just hasn't been. I'm like, no. My, my internal rage. I'm like, no, it needs to be there. It needs, it needs to be there. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. I don't understand. It, it creates rage inside me as to why it hasn't happened because the knowledge and and then and then occasionally I get a message that says, "Oh, this is groundbreaking work that you're doing." I'm like, "No, it's not. It's always been there. No, it's not groundbreaking. It's always been there. Why did not people know more about this?" So that's all. I can't. I can't. I can't help with that and with that conversation except to say I agree. I don't understand why there hasn't been more of a focus, more of an impact, more of anything. I know that there are good people who are now really keen and focused on it, but it still seems to be one of those backdoor things where you're like, ah, well, that's great. We'll do that after we've done everything else in the conference or whatever it is. And also, once again, we have to highlight that when we're in adverse situations and we're, we, there's no ambulances, we can't just ship someone off to the doctors or psychologists or, you know, or send them home. Um, things are really different. You know, we have massive highs and massive lows. And yeah. we live in close, confined spaces. We can't escape. You can't, some, you can't just go for a run. You, sometimes you can't even just put on a podcast. Sometimes you have no communications, which people find hard to believe in this day and age. But people like us and all of you watching still go to places where there's no Wi-Fi, you know. So sometimes we have no escape. And, and this is why we need these skills so much. And this is why we really believe that we can make such a difference and and we need to get this message. Also, also knowing that we can do the best training that we can for everyone, yeah. but that may never actually be enough. Sometimes yeah. it's going to be outside the scope, outside of this. And then all I can say to those situations is call you and call me. Yeah. And we may never have the brilliant solution, but we can provide support and we can provide um advice but advice and support as opposed to this is what you need to do and also what we can provide is a huge referral list yeah you girls are a bit wild for me I want someone that you know we we have some incredible people to refer you to from all walks of life you know from yachting military professional sports high performance corporate um and and you know even some of the more esoteric you know doing the breath work and the mes meditation and things like that too yeah so we are putting together and just about to launch a one day psychological first aid a four day psychological first aid and safety course and we're going to be running as well um live um face-to-face -face retreats which we're really excited about um Kate's already doing that with uh, first responders so do you want to just give a little rundown about what they can expect in these different courses and how they look so there's very different courses so what we run for firefighters and their background we run a five-day retreat at a terrifyingly beautiful beautiful environment i can i'll send that through in the links yeah. um it's a five-day course based on bessel van der kolk's work uh he if you don't know him you should read him um you should also read his book which is the body keeps the score and it's basically focused on the fact that trauma is not held in the brain it's held in the body and then how to unlock that before you can even unlock the brain side of things so the five-day retreats that we run with fire and rescue new south wales are yin yoga 
um, they are yin yoga, body work, ice baths. Um, I need, to, I, need, I need to repeat this, but basically yoga, ice baths, breath work, um, individual sessions with a clinical psychologist, um, group work in terms of social cookups, which is, you know, kind of big in terms of emergency services because they are accustomed to working teams. Uh, and there is uh a dog my dog who happens to be there um as a therapy dog and anyway all sorts of things there's five days there um and it includes just experiential stuff but then we spend a whole lot of time in the last the last 24 hours doing integration work like how does this practice how does this fit into your life? Does it fit into your life? Does it not? Does it all that kind of stuff? So anyway, um, we're hoping to roll this out with police and other emergency services next year. Um, and so we'll go from there. So I'm going to hand back over to Amanda. Um, we have lots going on from this end and we would love to include all of you not just on the retreat side of things, but on the one-to-one -one side of things. And I can categorically say that the, <laughs> that the other clinicians are very wonderful and they're a little bit naughty. So they're not like straighty 180s. They're more like someone else described them as elegant pirates. So they have your back. And, and you're going to meet them in the next couple of days because we're going to be you sharing. absolutely are. And, yeah. And exactly. Thanks, Amanda. Over to you. Um, yeah. And so also we're doing a one day, um, which will also be broken into online hours. So you, you've got the choice of having us come onto your yacht or your ex environment and we can deliver the course in a one day or four days, really similar to what we're doing with the medical care on board ships, medical first aid at sea and elementary first aid at sea. Um, and yeah, you've got the choice. We can run them at, at, as full days, one day or four days on board, or we can also be and are building our online version of that as well which we highly recommend you also get. Um, you will have some one-on-one -on -one time with a clinical psychologist, psychotherapist um, in, as well. Uh, so your needs will be covered. Do it. Do it. And it's just going to be ideal. So, hey, thanks so much for your time. I'm so stoked to be working with you. And we look forward to working with all of you in the not-too-distant future. Uh, likewise to everyone here. Over and out. Bye. Peace, everyone. Bye. Bye.